Chomet Beis. And uh, we mentioned yesterday that we'll be talking today a little about the obligation of women to daven. And um, as well as some people brought up the, uh, the question about women putting tefillin on. Um, so, uh, and I mentioned yesterday that the, the uh, I did mention that there was a great rabbi's wife who uh, did not daven, at least that's what her children uh, say, and that, that, uh, the name of that person is the Chavetz Chaim's wife. Chavetz Chaim was a, a, a very uh, famous, uh, well-known Pesach uh, codifier of Jewish law, and uh, uh, the, uh, he passed away in 1933, and um, he wrote the Mishnah Brura, uh, and uh, his son says that he doesn't remember when he was younger uh, that his mother ever davened. Uh, and so basically she relied on the more lenient view about women not being obligated to daven. Uh, not that she relied on it, that's what she said that the Chavetz Chaim told her. That the Chavetz Chaim, her husband, told her that she doesn't have to daven when she's taking care of the kids. So the question is, our Gemara is, our Mishnah says, Chayavin Bitfila. Women are chayiv in tefillah, the top line on page chafam and beis. So that's what we were going to discuss a little. What is the obligation of women in tefillah? So, uh, it, I mean, nowadays you have everything online. You have all the different uh, opinions and different views. But uh, there's a, um, it's a rabbi from, I believe from Detroit. His name is Rabbi Daniel Neustadt, who... Uh, uh, does a lot of, uh, writes a lot of uh, uh, halacha articles. So he writes that, uh, and the truth is, that, you know, there's, there's really two views. The, 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 uh, I guess we have to start with the Rishayim. The, the, the two views in the, in the Rishayim, in, uh, in the commentaries of the Gemara, are the Rambam and the Ramban. The Rambam holds that tefillah prayer is biblical. And what is the obligation of tefillah? The obligation of tefillah biblically is to ask Hashem at least once every 24 hours to pray to Hashem, to ask Hashem for anything you need. So that obligation, that mitzvah, can be fulfilled. The biblical obligation can be fulfilled by just reciting a small prayer. Every day, you take 30 seconds, you ask Hashem, you know, today should be a good day. Uh, I should be successful. I should feel good. I should be, feel healthy. Uh, whatever it is, you make some little prayer. You have fulfilled your biblical obligation of tefillah. And, of course, rabbinically, you have three, three, there are three prayers a day. Shachos mitchom You have, uh, you know, they, they entail, they, they consist of Shemana Esrei. They consist of the shachris consists of Sukkot de Zimra, you know, there are the blessings of Kriyashma, there's all the different parts of the prayer that are, that are you know, rabbinic, but uh, they are part of the obligation that we have to daven. And um, according to the Rambam, women are not, would not be obligated in tefillah, uh, except for the biblical obligation, which is an obligation that's, uh, you know, that, that, uh, th that is what the Gemara here calls rachame, rachame ninu. They are obligated in tefillah. It's rachamim, the mercy. They're asking Hashem for mercy, asking Hashem for that he should give, a, give them blessing. And so that would be the obligation, the biblical obligation of um, of simple, you know, of just reciting a prayer for mercy, asking Hashem for things that you need. That would be asking Hashem for mercy. Uh, that would be the way the uh, the Rambam understands it, and that would be the obligation of women. And the same thing would apply to avadim slaves who are obligated in mitzvahs, like women. Then you have the Ramban. The Ramban says that prayer is rabbinic, and the obligation of prayer applies not only to, to men, but the, 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 the rabbis 
established prayer, and that's the way they understand this, that's the way the Ramban would understand this Gemara, that it's Rachamein, and it's asking Hashem for mercy. Women should be should be obligated as well in, 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 in such mitzvahs. The rabbis established that mitzvah and they have obligated women as well. And, uh, you know, even the, 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 the question would be to what extent do they have to recite all the prayers or is it only the Shemona Esrei? The, so, so on that, we'll have the, you know, the, the opinions of the, uh, the, 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 the later scholars who can uh, help clarify that. But what that would mean is that women would be obligated, not in three prayers a day, but in two prayers a day. Shachris and Mincha. Myriv is very uh, much more lenient. And the reason it's more lenient is because even the obligation that men have to Davin Myriv, the, the night prayer, even our obligation, it initially was not a full-fledged obligation. Tfilas Arvis Rishus, the prayer of Myriv, which we've come across earlier in this uh, tractate, we've already uh, studied, we've seen this before, that Myriv initially, according to some opinions, and uh, possibly that's the halacha, that Myriv initially was Rishus, was a permissible, was a optional, and uh, the, the people uh, uh, took it on as an obligation. So once we've accepted it, are the Jewish community accepted it as an obligation. That's why men are obligated to David Myriv, even though initially, according to many opinions, it was only Rishus, it was only an option. It was optional. And the reason why it was optional is because we, we don't really bring a sacrifice at night. The, 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 the morning prayer is in place of this morning sacrifice. The afternoon prayer is in place of the afternoon sacrifice. The night prayer, what is it in place of? It's not really a, a sacrifice that's brought at night. It's in place of the fats that weren't burned during the day that we bring them up at night. But what that, that itself tells you that it's, it, it doesn't carry with it the same um, uh, obligation, you know, as the uh, chakras and mincha as the, the morning and the afternoon service. So initially, um, uh, it, 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 since it was never accepted, the only the obligation for us to pray the night service is because we accepted it on us. Women never accepted it on them. And therefore women would be exempt from my, at least according to 99% of the codifiers of Jewish law. There are some Sephardic, I think the Kavachaya might say that they should have in my roof, maybe or a Hashulchan, but the general, uh, uh, opinion is that women would be exempt from my I see we have a few questions. Robert, uh, you're muted. Got it. Yes, thank you. Um, again, what I'm grappling with, um, in addition to um, doing the, the prayers three times a day um, and the relationship between men and women, what's the place of reciting Tillam over, um, as part of an obligation or an exercise that men do or women do? within the, the plane of, of devotion, let's say, okay? Right, right, right. So Tehillim is, uh, it's interesting. Uh, you, you may find that women say more Tehillim yeah, than men. That, that's my reference, yeah. Uh-huh. And um, uh, Tehillim was, was, was uh, uh, commonly used as a uh, avenue to, to sort of connect with Hashem and ask Hashem for blessings. And... Um, being that, you know, women are constantly worried. The Yiddish mama is always nervous that everything should go well. It became very traditional the, uh, that women would constantly recite Tehillim because, uh, uh, you know, they, they're always, uh, they, they have time to worry. Men uh, were always busy, so they didn't worry as much because they were busy, therefore find that men were not always used to saying as much Tehillim. That's, that's the historical background of Tehillim, uh, from my understanding, why women say more Tehillim. Tehillim is a tremendous um, uh, 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 path to, uh, you know, to drawing down Hashem's uh, blessings for anything that one needs. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a, uh, but it's not an obligation, but I think it's more true, you know, that women sort of uh, uh, like to use that path 
as often as they can because it's comfort you know, because it really is a path towards comfort by repeat comfort. yeah but not yeah. that they understand not that people well, a lot of people when we recite to Hillel, we don't really know what we're saying a right. lot of people recited in hebrew and there it's more the the understanding that this is the jewish medicine to all problems right because it's more poetic i mean it's it's poetic more than anything else and so there is hidden meaning on contextual heating meaning in reciting to Hillam. Well, that's true. It is poetic and, and there's deeper meaning, but there, there's also a beauty, you know, it's also- Yeah, the readable. beauty is part of it as well, yes. Well, it's also very readable and if someone were to recite it in English, it would also be very powerful- Absolutely. Bringing blessings to, to, to them and even without a deep understanding. Uh, but even if they only do the Hebrew, it's also good, you know, even if they don't understand it. So it's, uh, Tehillim is great, but it's not really part of what we're calling Tefillah. Okay. Okay. So I don't, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's part of the Tefillah. Yes, uh, Ruben, you had a question. Yes, please. The uh, part of the uh, Tefillah that we do is based on Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov. So even though there's no Kabbalah associated with the Nighttime prayer of Yaakov wouldn't still have the same power and the same cheshiva, same strength. That's a good question. But basically, uh, if you want to re- uh, word that question a little differently, uh, that why would why is Yaakov's fila not as uh, obligation? Why is it not as much of an obligation as Avraham and Yitzchak's? That's uh, it's a good, very you know it's really a good very good question that Ruvain is is asking. What would be the reason? So I'm going to wait until Mirza uh, we get up to it. It's uh, that discussion is on Chav Chav Hey or Chav Vav twenty six. I think it's on page 20, 25 or twenty six, and it's on side B of twenty six twenty six B. So we will Mirza uh, uh, get into that there. But uh, so stick with us for another uh, six seven weeks. Mirza hopefully we'll get up to it. Yes, uh, David. Uh, yeah, this idea of um, the uh, people taking upon themselves uh, through the ages certain mitzvahs so they became more um, customary or uh, I forget how you explain it. So with, this, with the seven commandments of the children of Noah, the seven mitzvahs B'nai Noah. So there are seven, but throughout the time, many of the sages said that there are another three mitzvahs that because non-Jews do them, and have traditionally done them, they also should be part of these seven commandments. One of them is honoring parents. One of them is giving tzedakah. And the third one is prayer. And it's also explained the same way that you did it, that it's at least once a day, and it's, a, and it's not necessarily something that's formulated, just some type of prayer to pray to Hashem. So even non-Jews have this as part of their uh, it's not officially part of the Sheva Mitzvah, but many sages said that it is because throughout history, non-Jews have done these three extra mitzvahs of honoring their parents, giving tzedakah, and praying. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, uh, Yasha Kayach for mentioning that. I, I would just mention there is one other example that the Jewish people accepted on themselves, uh, and it became an obligation, uh, and that is a mitzvah that women do. And that is that women wait seven clean days even after their regular menstrual cycle, which according to Jewish law, the seven clean days was only if it was a abnormal cycle, not the regular menstrual cycle. And, um, and yet women accepted it on themselves that even if they just see a drop of blood, they, they wait seven clean days before they go to the mikvah. And that became an obligation, and uh, uh, it's there's there, there's no leniencies uh, on so, that, that obligation. Like it's not like well, ra- you know, it's a case of great need. You know, you can be there's no such thing. The, the women accepted it on themselves. It became a full fledged obligation, and uh, they wait. They always wait seven clean days. You know. Uh, for all uh, situations that are possibly that are you know that that are uh, tuma that are that they are tummy, so that would be another example similar to myriv that we accepted on ourselves as an obligation. Okay, but and Yosha uh, Kayach David for those uh, exam that's very interesting about the shiva mitzvahs uh, bnei the goyim accepting certain things uh, on themselves. 
Um, so, uh, so let's uh, go through the, uh, so th there's two sources that I just wanted to uh, just go through. One is this Rabbi Daniel Neustadt, where he says um, that you have these two views. Uh, there are halachic authorities who exempt women from formal davening altogether as long as they recite a simple supplication in the morning. And other pais can maintain that women are obligated to daven twice a day, shachos and mincha, just like men. Although most pais can agree that, that with the second view that women are obligated to daven, it was rare, it was a rare woman who davened formally in the olden days. So what that means is that the common a custom in the in the previous generations was that women did not daven Shemayna Esri. That was the common minhag. Women did not daven Shachris and Mincha. Um, it, it, it is something that, you know, women became much more literate now and, and uh, uh, you know, went through uh, seminaries and uh, Beis Yaakovs and Jewish schools and so on that, um, that things uh, that the um, the trend has changed, but the 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 the, um, the, the accepted halacha, the, the common view is that women should really daven, even though it was rare to find such a woman who did daven. And, and you know, they would say a little prayer, and that was how they fulfilled the the biblical obligation. Now, running a household was an all-consuming task. Many women were illiterate to boot. Most women, therefore, dispensed with their obligation to daven by reciting a simple supplication. Nowadays, we are witnessing a remarkable turnaround. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through all this. Um, women, nevertheless, women are still not as free to daven as men, and, and the demands on their time may legitimately conflict with the halachic times for davening. We will therefore list the order of importance of the parts of davening which take priority for a woman whose time is limited. Depending on how much time she has, she should recite as much, much as she can, recite them in the order in which they appear in the sitter. So he starts off, number one is reciting a simple prayer. Any prayer supplication that opens with praise of Hashem and ends with thanksgiving for his benevolence, such as the Bircha Sashachar or the Bircha Satayra is sufficient. So the morning blessings, um, and uh, a little prayer, that is the, the minimal. Shemona Esrei, the, the, main, the main prayer, the Amidah, the Shemona Esrei of the morning and the afternoon. This would be a minimum requirement. The first verse of Shema, which we just uh, spoke about yesterday, and Baruch Shem, although women are technically exempt from Shema, since it is a time-based mitzvah, they are exempt, but the Paiskim recommend that they should at least Accept Hashem's sovereignty that we learned in our Gemara that we we understood at least according to the way the Bach understands the Gemara that women are obligated in reciting and accepting the yoke of heaven even though they're exempt from Shema. Now the Birchas Hashach are the morning blessings and including the blessings on the Torah. Um, it does say that if she already said Shmona Esrei, she can no longer say the Al Natilas Yodayim blessing. That's I guess, uh, pretty obvious. Uh, okay, the blessing, MS Vyatsev, until Gaal Yisrael, they should remember the exodus from Egypt. So that would be included in the, the, the blessing after, which we, we, we mentioned this from the, from the Shulchan Aruch yesterday, and um, uh, that they should say the blessing after the Shema and then go straight into the Shema Esrei. The Psuke de Zimra, which would be the next level, um, which priority should be given to Baruch Sha'amar Ashrei, Nishmas on Shabbos and Yeshtabach. And then, then comes the entire Shema and the blessing of Yetzer Ar and Avarabba come after that. And then comes Karbonais with priority given to Parshas HaTamid. Um, and um, the, 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 the Parsha of Tumid means the, the, the section that talks about the sacrifice that was brought in the morning and in the afternoon. Okay, and um,
women are exempt from tachnun, ashri uvalatsiyayim, shir shalyayim, but it is customary for them to recite Olenu after Shemana Esrei. Women are exempt from Halal and Rish Chodesh, Pesach, Sukkot, Shavuos, because it is a time-based mitzvah, but some Paiskim require women to recite Halal and Chanukah, while others exempt them. From what I understand, a lot of women nowadays do say Halal, but the, the Paiskim debate whether women are obligated to David Musaf, it is customary for them to do so. Note that all tefillahs that they are exempt, Ashkenazic women are permitted to daven if they wish. Okay. And um, this, is, this is basically the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the uh, um, what Rabbi Neustadt has uh, put together based on maybe uh, 25 different sources here. And uh, I, I guess it's pretty, uh, pretty reliable. So that's very nice. Uh, the only other source that I was gonna bring is um, from um, Rabbi Sherpin, who writes a lot for the Chabad website. And he says, basically uh, follows um, follows the same the same uh, more or less the same uh, uh, halachas however uh, he, he emphasizes which is based on the Alter Rebbe Shulchan Aruch he does emphasize the uh, the obligation that women should say the Karban Tamid which is the uh, section in the Torah that talks about the uh, obligation to, to uh, bring the sacrifice in the morning and in the afternoon. And I think that's important to mention because I don't think it's common knowledge. I don't think most women always do that. And therefore, uh, it's interesting that both of them, I mean, Rabbi Neustadt also mentioned it. So it, it's interesting that, that, that is, there is an uh, importance in women reciting that. Okay, and now the... Rabbi. the Yes. Rabbi. Yes. It's Moshe. Uh, what about? <clears throat> I know Brakata Mazon. Women are. Uh, they say every. All women say it after they eat, obviously. But yeah, we're are gonna, they obligated? We're going to be. We're going to talk about that soon. Brakata Mazon, right in the Gemara. So let let's just wait a few minutes, and uh, maybe we'll get to it today. <laughs> now, what about women wearing tefillin? So, uh, people brought this up. I wasn't really going to get into it, but. Uh, it, it is important to know the the uh, the facts, and that is that um, the, the the widely accepted practice is that women do not wear tefillin. Why? Tefillin is a time-bound mitzvah. Women are generally exempt from such mitzvahs. Now, even though we do encourage mitz women to fulfill them, like women accept it on themselves, uh, you know to to do certain mitzvahs, they, they listen to Shofar and Rosh Hashanah, Sheikh Lula Van Sukkis. By the way, these would be other examples of women accepting mitzvahs. <laughs> According to some opinions, they became like obligations, and that would be hearing the Shofar on Rosh Hashanah would be another example, or Shaking Lula Van Sukkis. These are possibly cases of women accepting on themselves to fulfill certain mitzvahs, which almost which became like an obligation now for them to hear the, uh, the Shofar and and, uh, and to, sh to shake Lulo. But uh, the question is, why don't women do extra and like they do with the Shafer and the Lulo, they, they've accepted it on themselves. Why don't women put tefillin on? So the first opinion, this is what I think David mentioned it yesterday, that there is an opinion that uh, women uh, wearing tefillin would be loisilbash gever simlas isha, that a man shouldn't wear women's clothing, a woman shouldn't wear men's clothing. And this is considered a man's attire. And so the, ta the, the great Talmudic sage, Rabbi Yonason ben Ozeel, in his translation of the Torah, he sees this as prohibiting women from wearing talus and tefillin since they are men's clothing. So this is in the Targum Yonason ben Ozeel, that would be the source that would say that women would not be allowed to wear tefillin. However, there are others of the opinion that 
this does not apply to tefillin or uh, 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 talus. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, that is Rabbi Yenis and Ben Ozeel's opinion, but there are other opinions that say it doesn't fall into that category. And uh, uh, so this would not be enough of a reason uh, to prohibit wearing tefillin. Um, that, but that, that is one view. Now, Halacha teaches that when someone does something that's non-obligatory, it draws undue attention to their excessive piety in inappropriately ostentatious manner and is to be discouraged, which is something that we learned in our Gemara about um, uh, a chassan saying Shema after his wedding. And uh, uh, in, 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 even though nowadays it's, it's commonly done, but there were times when it was not appropriate for a chassan to say Shema after their wedding because their mind is overwhelmed with their thoughts of fulfilling the mitzvah of uh, being with their wife. And therefore they would be exempt from saying Shema. And it didn't look good, didn't look right if they go and say Shema as if they are showing off that they can have intention, concentration, uh, appropriate concentration. So the same thing would apply for women, uh, possibly that they should not wear tefillin because it would be something that's called yuhara. It's showing off and uh, uh, it would not be appropriate. Um, uh, so that is possibly a reason why women should not wear tefillin. Now, We know that women used to wear tefillin all day, that people, I'm sorry, men used to wear tefillin all day. What changed? So another question is, why do children not wear tefillin if we encourage them to do all the other mitzvahs? So he says, the reason is because it can, this can, all this can be traced to the exceptional degree of holiness of the tefillin due to the sanctity Wearing tefillin requires purity of thought and body. While some view this requirement as going so far that one needs to be pure of sin to wear tefillin, but most explain it to mean that when one wears tefillin, he must foster an awareness of Hashem and strive to constantly be conscious of the tefillin he is wearing. A high degree of physical cleanliness is also required as well. So... Um, So, so this is the importance of all this cannot be overstated. In fact, if a man cannot meet these requirements, he doesn't put on tefillin, although a rabbi should be consulted. But the, 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 uh, uh, the, the norm would be that he wouldn't put tefillin on. It is for the, the, this reason that nowadays to avoid compromising the holiness of tefillin, men wear tefillin only during prayers when they are in a state of awareness of Hashem and of cleanliness. This is also the reason boys not, do not wear tefillin until they're close to their bar mitzvah, at least according to the halacha reason. It seems that this requirement is also one of the reasons that there was a period of time when many men refrained from wearing tefillin altogether. Wow. Rabbi Moshe of Kausi, Kusi, 13th century related that he traveled throughout Western Europe, exhorting men to wear tefillin during the morning prayers, teaching that they could maintain cleanliness and purity of thought for at least the duration of the services. In light of the above, since women are not obligated to wear tefillin, the code of Jewish law rules that they should not do so, as it would mean voluntarily positioning themselves to perhaps wearing tefillin in an inappropriate state. So that would be um, in the Laws of Tefillin, chapter 38. And, um, and that's why it, would, it says there that women should, hey, let's pull it up. Chapter 38 in the Laws of Tefillin. Women are exempt. Women, slaves, and, uh, and uh, slaves our Canaanite slaves are exempt from tefillin because the mitzvah sase, it's a positive commandment that's time bound. And because Shabbos and Yom Tov is not a time of tefillin, if women want to be machmer on themselves to be stringent and to put them on, we protest because they don't know 
how to keep themselves. <laughs> it says because they don't know how to keep themselves in cleanliness. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it it, it, it means that uh, it might mean that we. I have read that it said the whole focus was on passing gas. And that I remember as a kid before Bar Mitzvah, they were talking about, you know, the big issue of you're not permitted to pass gas while you're wearing tefillin. Right. And it takes a little training and thinking and doing till you're really at a point. That's all. Okay, okay. So um, the, uh, the, the mitzvah of guarding the tefillin that they should be uh, born with cleanliness is the reason why we are moicha, we protest for anyone that's not obligated to wear tefillin that they shouldn't wear the, they shouldn't wear tefillin if they're not obligated to. So that's, uh, that's the Shulchan Aruch. And, um, and this gives the history, uh, you know, of uh, the fact that it, it, we used to wear tefillin all day and uh, children, we would think that we would encourage them to do tefillin, and yet we don't. Now, Rabbi. Yes, Moshe. Uh, okay, here's another uh, question I have. Um, let's say you have just one uh, second. If you want to just a ask message, a big message. Okay. Moshe, if you're going to say a let's say question, let me just finish this last thing. Then. Having discussed oh, okay, some of okay. the reasons why women don't put on tefillin, it must be noted that historically we find rare exceptions. Now, there is a legend, but there's no good source for it, that Rashi's daughters put on tefillin. It is most certainly a myth. But uh, people do say that. People say that Rashi's daughters wore tefillin. Uh, but the problem is there's no source uh, before the 19th century, of uh, 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 that this that this is true. So where do where do they get it from? Um, the top, but th there is a very important source in the Talmud that there was a woman that did wear tefillin. The Talmud notes that Michal, the wife of Shaul Hamelach, the wife of the daughter of Shaul Hamelach, the wife of David Hamelach, wore tefillin. Okay, so this is shocking to some people. She wore tefillin. Now, already in Talmudic times, the rabbis disputed whether her behavior was condoned by the sages of the era, of her era. Those who say that the sages protested are of the opinion that women are explicitly prohibited from wearing tefillin. Others explain that due to Michal's extraordinary piousness and the fact that she was a princess and a queen, she was able to maintain purity of body and though and thought when it, purity of body and thought when putting on tefillin. So there is such a opinion that she was allowed to wear tefillin. Number one, she was a princess. And what does being a princess do? Also, you, I should mention she had no children. It is known she had no children. And, um, uh, but being a princess, um, addresses the general issue of cleanliness because, um, and uh, uh, possibly the fact that uh, the issue that we mentioned earlier that um, dressing with a man's clothing, that the reason for that is that a woman might mix with men if she dresses like a man or a man might dresses like a woman would mix with women. And because she was a princess and a queen recognized by all, there was no, there was no chance of that. So that could be a reason why we would not be worried of that reason. Um, however, the, the, the thing is that Shulchan Aruch rules that even if you don't have the reasons of cross-dressing, uh, that would still be a problem. So it doesn't 100% answer that issue. Um, but for but basically she didn't have chill, she didn't have any issues of cleanliness uh, uh, issues around the uh, uh, children's diapers and things like that. Um, uh, in addition to the fact that she was a queen and a princess, so 
uh, she basically uh, had maybe no worries. Maybe that's the reason why it mentions this, that she would have uh, not, you know, been a she would have been able to concentrate. Anyway, regardless, it seems quite clear that her actions were not intended to set a public precedent. Indeed, the very fact that the Talmud needs to go back more than a thousand years to the days of Shoal to find an example of a woman who wore tefillin, it indicates that it was a unique occurrence. On a deeper level, the Kabbalists explain that although for mystical reasons, women do not put on tefillin, Michal being the deeply spiritual woman that she was, knew that she was a reincarnation of a male soul. And it is for this reason that she wore tefillin. That's from the Kafachayim. So that's a powerful, a very interesting uh, statement uh, from the uh, Sephardic Kabbalist, uh, Kavachayim, who says that she knew she was a reincarnation of a male soul, and she, she understood that she was supposed to put tefillin on. Um, in any event, it's not something that we uh, should uh, see as a uh, precedent, but it's important not to, not to hide that from history. It's a fact, you know, and, and very important that we... Uh, you know, we can't say that no woman ever wore tefillin. We do have a Gemara that says Michal did wear tefillin, and uh, she was definitely a very righteous woman and a holy woman. But there is discussion if the rabbis accepted that or not, if that was acceptable according to the view of the rabbis of her time. And um, definitely not a precedent. And in Shulchan Aruch, it says you have to uh, protest if women do put on tefillin. So that, I think, pretty much covers the... Uh, the tefillin uh, discussion, and uh, now, uh, Moshe, you had a question. Uh, let, uh, let's say. Well, questions. this may be devi this may be deviating a little bit from the, the situation, but what about Ashkenazim and Sfaradim with regards to, to, to tefillin? Uh, I know that um, you know I, 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 the reason for why a Ashkenazi can wear Sephardic tefillin, but a Sfaradi cannot wear Ashkenazi tefillin. It has something to do with the parashot within the uh, the containment, you know, the, the compartments. Um, am I correct about this? Is this uh, is this true? Am I? I? I'm not aware of that. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, I, I don't know, you know, I'm not a uh, Paisic. I don't know, you know, uh, halacha inside out. Um, it's but something, something to do with one of the parashot is, uh, is, is folded and it's closed and the other three are open and it has something to do with uh, I, the Ashkenazim are, uh, I mean, the Sephardim are not allowed to to use uh, Sephardic to fill in. I, I, uh -huh. I'm, I guess we could I'm ask Google. Google I, is a very, very good, uh, knowledgeable rabbi. Our uh, rabbi uh, Shomar Ashkenazim allowed to wear Sephardic. Rabbi, rabbi Smith, wouldn't Rabbi uh, Salmar be able to give you an answer? Uh, probably, but uh, we're not going to call. Let's just see if uh, Google might know. Uh, I don't see uh, I don't see anything here. Uh, okay. I don't, this is the first possible. I've heard of it. Yeah, possible. I guess it's considered you know it's considered possible for you know uh, from what I understand for. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not aware of it. I don't see anything off you know. Uh, uh, I could look in the Hebrew uh, Google, uh, maybe see something there. But uh, if you want to look into it, Moshe, that would be great. That's uh, if anyone wants to look into that. That's uh, that would be interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, uh, David. Yeah, I think it's uh, very interesting that it was Michal who was the one that was wearing tefillin. And we were talking about not wearing tefillin because it was, I for, I for, like, ostentatious. It was like a big deal. You know, I forget, like, a simpler um, term right. for ostentatious. But she was the one. You said that she didn't have any children. She was punished because she, she was criticizing David Melech for being ostentatious because he was dancing in front of the Aram. So uh -huh. it's funny. She was the one that wore the tefillin right. Right. In, in, in lieu of this whole story. Well, the only thing that I could possibly answer, I'm not sure, but maybe she wore the tefillin in a, in a very private, uh, you know, she did not do it publicly. And uh, possibly that would be why, you know, why it would have... Uh, it wouldn't have been a contradiction to and be hypocritical of her. In other words, David Amelech was dancing in public in, in front of everyone. Uh, David Macharkir Bechol, right, he was dancing and uh, making a whole, uh, uh, a whole public uh, uh, scene. And uh, so possibly she, you know, she only put it on in, a, in private and, uh, and 
uh, did what she understood was uh, appropriate. Um, yes, uh, Robert. We I, know about it. I have two questions. Oh, David, did you want to say something? I just said that we, well, it couldn't have been that private because we know about it. Okay. Well, it, it could be the rabbis, you know, her husband or, you know, it could be the rabbis talked about it. Maybe she asked the rabbis, maybe, you know, or it could be, you know, it was something that, that came up, but not that um, she did it, not, not that anyone ever saw her do it. You know what I mean? It could be, it was just a, uh, what she told them, you know. Uh, yes, Robert. All right. So maybe it went over my head, but what is the difference between Ashkenazic and Sephardic to fill in? I, maybe I didn't, I didn't yeah, catch the I, nuance. Was, you're going to have to talk to Moshe about that. All right. Not, all right. Good. All right. That's not so my not, department. Okay. So another, another statement is um, I was visiting a friend who grew up as a, in the Lubavitch movement. And at the end of uh, Shacharit, he put on a second set of tefillin because right. there's addition. So tell me about that. Or I don't, if others yeah. don't know about it. I mean, honestly, it's not so applicable here, but it's something called Rabbeinu Tam tefillin, and it has to do with a different order. Of the okay. of the of the portions, how they're placed in the in, in the uh, in the shell in, in the in the in the roche, the order of, of right, you know which what, what's the order, and it was Rabbi Tam was a grandson of Rashi, and he okay. argued he argued on his grandfather. His grandfather felt that they should go in one order, and his grandson. And the story goes that the the that uh, Rabbi Tam. Uh, somehow spilled the ink uh, on it. He was sitting on his grandfather's lap and he spilled the ink and his grandfather said, ah, I see he's going to argue on my opinion. Uh, sure enough, uh, that's, that's what happened. So yeah, so, but it's, it's Rabino Tomsfeldin and it means that basically pious Jews want to fulfill all opinions. They'll put on okay. that extra pair of fillin, even though it's very expensive to buy another pair of fillin and it takes time every day, five minutes uh, you know, extra every day to put on that extra pair, but they want to fulfill according to all views. And according to Kabbalistic writings, supposedly the view of Rabbeinu Tam is more according to Kabbalistic reasons. It's important. So therefore, uh, not, not only Chabad puts on uh, uh, a lot of uh, Hasidic Jews, because, uh, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an act of Hasidus. It's an act of extra okay. stringency that Hasidim uh, try to, you know, be more machmir, be more strict and, and follow, you know, cover all, you know, especially cover a Kabbalistic uh, um, opinion. So, so they put on uh, Rabbi Tom to fill it. Uh, yes, Ezra. Uh, the, there's also another minhag, another way that people do this is that they put both the regular set of tefillin and the Rabbi Tom at the same time. So they put hmm. the two heads and then they, they put the two arms uh, at, at the same time, and they were throughout the entire uh, davening. Yeah, I've I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's far, a lot, there are. I, I guess it's so far. It's a Sephardic, I think, custom. Yes, uh, Ruben, you you you're trying to say something here. I'm not sure. A woman who even knows for sure that she was a man in a former lifetime it is now a woman. She was required in tefillin, but now Hashem has given her a new set of mitzvahs. Uh, yeah, I think Ruben's asking what what happens for a woman who knows that she used to be a man. Should she follow Michal's uh, 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 way of doing things? Uh, first of all, I don't know who you could trust to, to 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 tell you that you were a previous. How would you know you're a previous reincarnation of a man? And just because some guy tells you that you are, I don't know if uh, he knows. And second of all, I, I think it's very clear that we don't, this was not a, a message. This is not something that we can follow and we can uh, uh, go by. We have Shulchan Aruch that says you're not allowed to. And uh, we have to protest if anyone does such a thing. And, uh, and it's possible that even, the, even, you know, in her days, she was wrong for what she did. There are such opinions that she was 100% wrong. Okay. Um, I think there was one other question. Is someone else trying to ask something? Uh, uh, Yehuda, did you have a question? No. Okay. All right. So now we can get to the Gemara. Um, I, I'm sorry. I have two questions. Um, if, if, if I can uh, keep track. You said there was a Kabbalistic authority who, who gave that uh, uh, opinion regarding um, the uh, wearing of Fill in by the women, and also, if you could just mention uh, again 
the order of importance of the different tefillot. Uh, I think it started with the blessing of the Torah, and it included the leaving Mitzrayim and the Pesuke uh, de Zimra and the Ashray. I mean, I yeah. didn't get the whole... I'll have to email it to you. I don't want to. It's it's online. It's Rabbi Daniel Neustadt, and it's online. But I'll I'll, I'll email it to you, Mr. Shem. I don't want to take up more time. We hardly have time. In fact, I've okay. been having thoughts of uh, making my morning class into a hour and a half class instead of an hour, okay. just because this, then we never get anywhere. Okay, uh, we have great discussions, but uh, it's very hard to uh, cover ground. So, uh, but I'll try to email that out. Okay, uh, Kriya Shema Shita. So the Gemara says. Actually, let me just read the, the top line of the Mishnah. So, Chayovin Betfila, women and uh, slaves are obligated, men slaves, men, men slaves, uh, Canaanite slaves who are partially uh, converted, but not completely because they're still slaves. So, they are obligated in Tfila, Uve Mezuza, and in Mezuza, Uve Berchas Hamazin. We said that there's two ways of reading it there's, Rashi, there's Rashi's way. Um, that it's also children that are um, uh, the children are obligated in tefillah, mezuzah, and berchaz also. Uh, and also. Uh, and Taisa's way was that it, we're not talking about children here. We're only talking about the adults. And they're obligated in tefillah and mezuzah and in berchaz hamazin and in grace after meals. And now the Gemara is going to go through why are they exempt or is it obvious that they're exempt? In other words, the Gemara has... Either it's very obvious or, or the Gemara, you know, so the Gemara is going to ask these questions like, of course they're exempt. So like, for, uh, let's start with the first line of the Gemara. Gemara, Kriyashma Pshita. Gemara says, Kriyashma? Recital of Shema? Pshita, of course they're exempt. Of course women are exempt. Mitzvah Sasei Shazman Gramahu. Oh, we actually did this yesterday, right. To Mitzvah Sasei Shazman Grama. Uh, and every... Mitzvahs I say that's the dependent on time women are exempt. So the Gemara answered that we would have thought that because it's accepting the yoke of heaven, they should say all three parshas of Shema, but it comes and lets us hear that uh, they're not obligated in all three parshas of Shema just because it has accepting the yoke of heaven. Instead, they uh, they can recite, of course, the first verse of Shema and, um, and <laughs> obligated in the other paragraphs of Shema. They are exempt. Of course, as one of the uh, prayers, if they, you know, if they're reciting the prayers, uh, they're going to, you know, they can say the Shema. It's one of the additional prayers that if they have time and they're going to recite it, you know, they can, they can recite it. Um, Umin ha and they are exempt from tefillin. Pshita, of course they're exempt from tefillin. And why is it pshita? Why is it obvious that they're exempt from tefillin? Because tefillin is a mitzvah saseh, it's a positive commandment that's dependent on time. So of course they're exempt from tefillin. So the Gemara says, mahu detema, you might have said, payol v'iskish l'mezuzah, since it's compared to mezuzah, they might be obligated. Because it says, Ukshartem and Ukhsavtem. So I would think just like women are obligated in mezuzahs, they also are obligated in tefillin. It comes and lets us hear, our Mishnah comes and lets us hear that they are exempt from tefillin. And, and the reason is because tefillin is also compared to Torah. And uh, that comparison, they, just like they're exempt from Studying Torah, they're exempt from tefillin. Okay, the chayavin betfila, and they're obligated in davening. And the Gemara says the rachamein. Now here, the Gemara does not ask pshita. At least our Gemara, our Gemara doesn't say pshita. Obviously, they're obligated in tefila. Doesn't say obviously. And Rashi tells us the reason is because prayer is rabbinic. And because prayer is rabbinic, that's the way Rashi holds. We've seen that before. Rashi holds prayer is rabbinic. Because it's rabbinic, so you don't ask. Obviously, they're obligated. And um, um, uh, and uh, the laws of um, 
mitzvahs say shehazman grama, the positive commandments that are dependent on time, that exemption doesn't apply if it's rabbinic. And uh, Rashi, so, so, so the, the Gemara just explains, why are they obligated in tefillah? It's rachame ninu, it is uh, rachamim. And now our Gemara does say a line here, but the Bach says we're supposed to re- take it out. Because um, according to Rashi, you would just leave it out. And you just say uh, that they're obligated in tefillah because it's mercy. Now, the way Teisvis learns over here, Teisvis has um, uh, an option to include even rabbinic laws do apply. Um, uh, do, 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 you, you, you could apply the laws of mitzvah saseh, shazman, grama, time-bound rabbinic commandments. Because we do find that the mitzvah of saying Hallel, that women are exempt from Hallel. Now, here you have a rabbinic law that they're exempt because it's a time-bound mitzvah. So you, Rashi was following the logic that time-bound mitzvahs don't apply when it's rabbinic. Taisva says that that's not exactly so. There are rabbinic mitzvahs that are exempt when they're time bound. And according to that, you could say the Gemara, you could say um, that the Gemara asks, they're obligated in tefillah. The Gemara could, Tysus has a girsa that said there is, there was such a version that said, Shita, obviously they're obligated. And uh, because it says, um, so the Gemara answers that because it says night, morning, and noon, you might think that it's considered like a time-bound mitzvah tefillah. And come Ashbalan, it comes and lets us hear that it's not time-bound. So even if it's rabbinic, you could say that it might still be limited to, 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 to the laws of time-bound mitzvahs, and therefore you might think that they're exempt from tefillah, and therefore the uh, Mishnah comes and lets us hear that they are obligated in tefillah because it's rachame, it's asking Hashem for mercy. So that's, the, um, uh, that's this uh, Gemara that we've uh, now uh, we've understood according to... Um, and of course, it, it follows according to the Rambam and the Ramban, according to the two views, if uh, tefillah is uh, biblical or if it's rabbinic, basically, you would have those, uh, the, the, you know, either they're obligated in a full-fledged tefillah, like a Shemona Esrei, or they're obligated in uh, just reciting a prayer. Okay, now, uve mezuzah, and they're obligated in mezuzahs. The Gemara here says, pshita, obviously, they're obligated in mezuzah. Why should they not be obligated? So mahu de tema, you might have said, hoyel the iskish la since it's similar, it's compared, it's it's connected to Talmud Why? Because it says, Vilimaritem Isam Espanechem in the second paragraph of the Shema, it says, You should teach them to your sons. And next to it it says, and you should write them. Why does it say uh, right next to it about the mezuzah next to the Torah? So it teaches us women are exempt. Um, you, you, you may say that it's teaching you that women are exempt from mezuzah, even though it's not a time-bound mitzvah, because it says you should teach your sons, and it's a mitzvah to teach your sons and not your daughters, Tyra. So also mezuzah, you would say maybe women are exempt. And so our Mishnah comes and lets us hear that women are obligated to be, are, are obligated to put on mezuzahs. And the reason is because it says, um, in order that your day, what would you say, Isaac? It says Beisecha. You lost the rabbi. No sex to the. Uh huh. <clears throat> That's true. However, 
the fact is there's a heckish. And that heckish, that comparison, that the connection, the fact that it's written right next to it would give, would possibly uh, tell you that, <coughs> that you are exempt, just like you're exempt from teaching Torah to your, to your daughters, because women are exempt from studying Torah. And um, so maybe mezuzah would be the same. And the answer is because it says afterwards, in order that your days should be lengthened. So the, 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 uh, the, the, the teaching is the only days of men need to be lengthened. Women's days don't need to be, don't, women don't need life, only men need life. So therefore, women are also obligated in mezuzah, just like men are obligated. So I guess the, 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 uh, the understanding is that you have two teachings that are next to it, that are next to the laws of mezuzah. And this teaching of the law of mezuzah teaches you not to follow the other way of comparing mezuzah to Torah, Torah study, because it says, Laman Yerbu Yes, uh, Ben. Ben? Ben? I wanted to ask, I don't, I don't understand when you say mezuzah, is it the mezuzah on the doorpost or you're talking about something else? No, How can it be time bound? So, so again, we are, to, we, we are talking about a mezuzah on a doorpost and on all the doors of one's house, one is obligated to place a mezuzah except on a bathroom. Uh, uh, the person would be obligated to place mezuzahs on all their house. And the question is if women might be exempt. And so, the, the, the Mishnah said they're if not. they exempt. live by themselves, how would the woman be exempt? Is uh, it when they live by themselves? Or? Oh, your question is the Gemara's question. The Gemara says, Pshita, obviously they're obligated. That's your question, right? They're obviously yeah. obligated, yeah. right? So that's the Gemara asked. So what did the Gemara answer? What's the words after Pshita? I'm not there, so I'm... <laughs> You gotta be here. Yeah, I know, but I, don't I, have I, was asking a question, I was asking a question, so I lost my place. Ah, the mezuzah psita mahu de tema. You might have said, hoyo, since. Since it is uh, uh, connected to Talmud Torah, it is. Uh, next to Talmud Torah in the, in, the, in the Torah, it's written right next to the laws of Talmud, the mitzvah of to teaching Torah. So therefore, you may say, just like teaching Torah to your daughters, women are not obligated in Torah. So you would say that the same thing applies to mezuzah, that they're not but obligated. The mezuzah is on the doorpost. It's not the, the Torah is not on the do doorpost. That's right. You're right, it's not time bound, but the fact that it says it next to the laws of, Miz of Torah says that you're supposed to learn from it, you, you possibly to teach the same law, that just like it says here, it says there. The same law that applies here applies there. So even though you don't have the exemption of time bound, but you, you, you have a, a, a teaching that this should be exempt, not because of time bound. Oh, time bound is I, one exemption. Would, this would what be another. I'm saying, what I'm saying is, if I have mezuzahs on my doors, how can my wife be exempt? <laughs> you need to have mezuzahs, so you would 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 be stuck with mezuzahs. She would have to li live in a house with mezuzahs. You're right. If you're married and you need a mezuzah, she's going to be stuck having I mean, mezuzahs. On. What about if she lived alone? What about that's someone who what I'm alone? saying. Maybe when she lives alone, that's what yeah, I, that's, that's what I said in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, the case would be talking about where she lives alone, not where she lives with a man. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, for sure we're talking about that case. But even in that case, you have a good question. Why Why should she be exempt if she lives alone? It's not a time-bound mitzvah. It's, the, yeah. the, it's, it's, it's based on the doorpost. So it's a good question. And the answer, Gemara's answer is that you might have thought to learn it, a special uh, way of deducing laws from the Torah, you might have thought to learn it from the, the law that it says next to it. It's called Hekish. Right. Okay. Right. So now comes the next Gemara. And then Gemara says... And with saying grace after meal. Pshita, the Gemara says, of course they're obligated. Grace, mahu de tema, 
you might have said, <laughs> since it says, says Hashem lachem ba'erev, when Hashem gives you in the evening basar lachol, meat to eat, v'lechem ba'biker l'spaya, and morning, in the morning bread to be satisfied, I might think that it's a time-bound mitzvah, it's the, the set times to eat. And to mitzvah sasei man grava, it should be like a time-bound mitzvah, dummy, is similar to, Kamash Malana comes and lets us hear that it's not a time-bound mitzvah and women are obligated in grace after meals. Okay, I think we're going to stop here.